Habit is the definitive model of the tiny crew, go out and do it yourself, everybody pitches in, the, all the roles are blurred. My producer also carried the mic and the boom pole. I did the makeup, many of the props. Frank DeMarco did all the cinematography with just two guys helping him. And there was nobody down the hallway with a walkie-talkie, you know, you had to live in the moment, live in the atmosphere of what you were doing, and this gave a vitality. These were the movies where we found a way to make movies that were as exciting and vital. She really fucking messed with me, like, you know, like in this really weird way. I'd made the movie in 1981, and it was starring my friend Brendan Mee. He was a really smart guy, very vitriolic and funny. He had a quality that was really hard to define. So Aaron we met, he ran a theater right on Ludlow Street, which was one of our locations, and he was somebody that Dayton knew. I see Dayton walking around the East Village with this other guy. The way they were walking around, I could sort of tell that they were scouting for a film. I was doing a show called Easy Pieces Found Text Theater, where I would act cookie boxes and recipes and grant proposals, and it had done really well in Seattle. It had been the hit of the Seattle Fringe. Dayton came to see it with this man with this incredibly loud laugh. And I thought he was like Dayton was hanging out with this mad Australian. I sort of pegged him as a mad Australian film director auteur. Boom, I got an audition for Habit. I did it and I was like, oh, I think I have it, I got it was one of my favorite things uh, about Habit was this one sit down with him because he was as eccentric as Brendan. He sort of captured this kind of theatrical vibe and very sort of uh, flippant and, you know, got close to the quality that Brendan had. Larry said, how would you play this role? And I'd already figured it out. I said, I would play it as Dayton. Because I've been watching them for weeks walk around the East Village as this duo. So it was Larry and Dayton, and it's Sam and Nick. I shaved my head just like Dayton. I got the crew cut. I got Dayton's glasses. I wound up trying to portray, anyway, was that sort of working friendship that they had as they were building Habit. Heather was a dear friend who's a performance artist, and I wanted her involved because she was a great actress. Patricia, who plays Ray, was just a friend and uh, ironically, she was not an actress, but she had a great intellectual curiosity and was very interested in the arts. Sometimes I like to work with people who just seem intelligent and interesting, and uh, I feel like I can set up an atmosphere of collaboration such that their performances will be sound, you know, whether they're actually an actor. I knew Heather. I worked with her um, at Cafe Bustello. The first time I ever directed was at Cafe Bustello. Heather and I then did a lot of different things together. We were in plays together. I must have met Larry a few times through her. And I think that that's where he and I connected the most was through our inter intellectual curiosity for each other or for horror, you know, and that we had lots and lots of conversations about horror. Everything was a surprise to me because I had never done film. It felt like we were living it. I mean, it felt like it was about Larry's life. It felt like it was about my life. It felt like it was about Heather's life living in the East Village at that time. We we're trying to figure out how to make our lives. Beginning to not have a good time at it and realizing, wait, how long are we going to do this? Well, look, the movie was going to be called Denial. For me, it's both a movie about loneliness, but it's also about connections, you know, attempts, friendship, moving forward, and the attempt to try to understand another person and what they're going through. Every decade has a particular loneliness that comes with it. In the 30s, around the 30s, people are now coupling and leaving the people who are still perpetuating their, their childhood or their adolescence or their drinking. Nick is in denial about our sort of division, like we're, we're a couple, but we're so coupled in this kind of awful way. They're struggling. There's sort of a chilly winter that is going on in that relationship. Sam and their, their revels has been his refuge. Nick and Sam are great drinking buddies, but when that sort of dries up and Sam reaches out, Nick doesn't really have the mechanism to help him. So it's, that's the loneliness. It's not the old big city loneliness. It's incredibly intimate loneliness. He can't connect to his 
supposedly his best friend. That's the sadness of the movie is that are we, do we have friendships, you know? Who will go to bat for you when you're really down and out? And the mechanism to describe that is the idea that Sam thinks his girlfriend's a vampire, which isn't possible. There comes a time in any friendship where if a friend is struggling with mental illness uh, or, you know, dating a vampire, can you help your friend? Can you offer actual help? Or do you watch them be swept out to the ocean by a riptide, you know, of their own insanity or drug addiction or dating a vampire? The East Village is filled with these glorious narcissists. And are they prepared actually, at the end of the day, to help someone else? without inconveniencing themselves or their dreams. Nobody else can really understand when you're in some, some sick thing with somebody. It's very, very hard to, to express it. And plus, like I think that Sam wants to keep his secret because he's still kind of fascinated a little bit by it. I mean, he's fascinated by it till the end. He's having sex with her on the floor while he's killing her. He never lets go himself. I mean, he'd much rather die than let go. There's a loneliness um, within that thing of like, how do I tell anybody about the hell I'm living? What would it be like if you really met a vampire? Well, no one would believe you and that would be the biggest problem. If you have cancer, your friends come to your aid. We all know what's going on. If you have something that no one knows what it is, it's scarier. The big city wasn't really the biggest problem. But in the movie, I try to suggest that there's a lot of people going through that. There's the homeless guy, there's the people in the windows opening the refrigerator dejectedly. And my point is, is there's so many lonely lives, but each one is very personal. And we just happen to tell this story. It's also a, a movie about not facing your reality. And he's obviously a freaking drunk, but he's like, that must be a vampire in my life. I'm obsessed with human beings' inability to face reality and uh, sort of man up and respond to the, the crisis that's facing them. And in his case, he's just depressed and alcoholic and loses his faith in his friends and goes running to this um, scapegoat that's not going to really be there for him in the end. There's nobody driving. There's nobody in that world who's going to save anybody else. That one guy who might have saved him, who's totally a Rosemary's Baby character, even the person who's like meant to function as the savior within the film, like, is ineffectual. Everyone is alone. Everyone is drifting apart. It's inevitable. I mean, it really is. Everybody's very sad in the movie. <laughs> but, you know, this is all that stuff that happens when you're, you know, at that time in your life where people are coming and going and you're breaking up with people. Those were the complicated relationships I had when I was younger. You know, when you're still in school and people are sleeping around and everybody's talking behind each other's back. So I'm really just conveying that. I really approached all the actors as friendly equals. I mean, it's a very specific movie because I'm in it and it's clearly was something personal to me. So in a way I was always on as Sam and sort of relating to them and trying to create an intimacy that we could then use to, to play off of. It did seem like we were living inside of it. Like that party was in his apartment. And that went on for like a whole night. I think we were there the entire night and day. And then the same thing when we went to Long Island, we like lived there together for like two nights. He would give like very small directions, but the dinner table, like when we were all Thanksgiving, that felt like that was more like let this evolve. He wanted the energy to sort of flow between all of us. I always say in this movie I'm directing from the inside, you know, I'm actually in the scene with most of these people so you can almost guide as you're playing. It was, it was very cool, it's really why the movie was, uh, I think, very special for, for me and hopefully for the players. And I think for the crew also, what little guys there were there, it was uh, such a strange experience. We called it ninja filmmaking and uh, I think that was the term that the, the crew was using. And so you would have these incredible backdrops like the San Gennaro Festival. That's a you know, multi-million dollar set that you can just grab. I would have this experience of um, doing a show at my theater, walking off stage, going upstairs to my apartment, changing into Nick's clothes, walking over to the San Gennaro Festival, 
shooting for five minutes, seven minutes, and then walking back to the theater and getting the, the light show up, you know, tearing tickets and stuff like that. So it was just, it was all just so fluid and it was our environment. I always compared it to Shakespeare's London in terms of the ferment, the artistic energy around us. One of the funny things was that the vampire, Meredith, took a lot of time and energy to shoot. She was always having to get naked and paint her body with mud and crawl through windows. So those, those shoots were always very complicated. With Meredith, we worked very hard on the whole thing. We worked to become comfortable doing the sex scenes, and they were all choreographed very specifically. And I was obsessed with how she dressed and looked, and you know, it's, this was my monster, you know, in my movie. I loved Meredith as a person. Like I felt like she and I like just really were able to connect very easily. Except for the kissing scene where I was like completely afraid of being kissed by her. <laughs> She's constantly digging, but that also, like when I look at that in hindsight, I kind of think of it as playful. Like it's a little bit flirtatious. Like let's see how far I can push you. And let's see how far you can, I can push you. If there are two people and they both have power, whether it's women or men, how are they gonna sort of find their place with each other, you know? I'm just somebody who has a, like a deep connection to Sam and is protective of him. So I'm not a th an immediate threat the way Liza is. The way I'm a threat maybe to Anna is more that I have a certain amount of power that like you said about Ray, she sees things, she's able to see things. So that's where she's got to disarm me. She's got to disarm my seeing. If she charms and seduces me by showing me her power, then after that, I don't say anything to him about, you got to leave her. But I leave with her, you know? You know, occasionally she sort of said, what am I doing with all these guys filming these scenes? And I don't, you know, what if they're creeps? And I think we really, put her at ease throughout the shoot that that wasn't the case and that our intentions were good. One of my favorite things about Meredith is that she really didn't continue on and so it became very mysterious. She came to her senses and decided not to continue acting and uh, I've kept in touch with her only vaguely over the years and allowed her her privacy. Maybe she'll reemerge one day, we don't know. Or maybe she never was there at all. We weren't all career actors, you know what I mean? We might be career artists or uh, creative people, but we just came together for that movie, which was a kind of a slice of life of downtown at that moment. And we knew that we were working on something special. For years, I would sometimes be stopped at airports and like, hey, you're that guy. You're the head vampire. I'd be like, what? <laughs> you're like, you know, I'm the, I'm the head vampire? Oh, right. You're right. I was the head vampire. No, but we're the only two people who ever figured that out. You know how some movies, like, get better with time? I feel like it has gotten better with time. It's like watching it again, I can see it being outside of that moment. I don't feel like you can easily dismiss it as, oh, nostalgia for that time. I really like that movie. I like the way it's shot. Um, I love the vampire in it. I have nothing but affection for it. I love the way Frank, you know, the colors in the movie, a lot of the stuff I said that we planned, and I think it's put together well. Uh, my own performance, I'm okay with, and I don't always like my stuff. I feel like uh, it's pretty honest. I feel that movie's an attempt at something genuine. Turn your eyes.